Today we're going to be reading from one of my favorite recent reads. It's kind of a brutal slasher meets coming of age. Nah, really, it's it's more of a young boy befriends brutal slasher. Of course, we're talking about Christopher Rufty's Pillow Face. Let's get it started. Thank you, everybody, for joining me on episode 56 of First Chapter Freak Show. Of course, I'm your host, horror author Carver Pike, and I'm excited about this one because, as I said in the beginning of the show, I'm a fan of the book Pillow Face. Uh, it's one of my favorite recent reads. In fact, I've got a paperback copy here in front of me. Here's Pillow Face. And no, it is not signed because I totally fucked that up, and I'll tell you about that here in just a second. But, um, so, as you know, noticed, I just dropped the F-bomb. So, real quick, what do I do here on each episode is I read the beginning chapters of my horror friend's author's books. And, um, you decide if you like what you hear, you go out and hopefully you'll pick up their book that I'm reading and all their work and, and keep buying all their stuff as they keep producing work. That's kind of the point of the show is that hopefully you'll find authors that you haven't read yet and they will find readers in the process it's kind of the fun of the show i'm not a professional reader or narrator i don't do voices i just read for the hell of it read for the fun of it so don't judge the author on my reading abilities please it's just for for fun here um also i do drop the f-bomb quite a bit I spit a lot of foul filth and shit all the time. I read a lot of extreme horror on the show, so you never know what I'm going to say. I can't remember. It's been a while since I read Pillow Face. I, can't, I know it's pretty gory and graphic. I can't remember how bad the language is in it. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I read on the show is pretty is pretty nasty. Um, a lot of it is extreme horror. And I just tend to uh, curse quite a bit when I talk. So you want to make sure you have the little ones out of the room or have earbuds in your ears that you've got sensitive people out of the room so you don't get in trouble and you don't get me in trouble and you know we all just have some fun with this but that said let's keep going so i had the pleasure recently of meeting christopher rufty at the scares that care author con in fact we sat pretty much right next to each other in the splatterpunk uh panel that we had it was a lot there were a lot of us man there were like fucking 20 authors or something like that it was pretty awesome we just all talked about splat the splatterpunk genre and uh, extreme horror and stuff like that. And so I got the opportunity to sit right next to him, and I did pick up uh, his. I did get signed copies from Chris of The Lurkers and Hell Departed, which is Pillow Face versus The Lurkers, which I was looking forward to getting because I liked Pillow Face. But where I dropped the ball was I bought Pillow Face on Amazon. The paperback and forgot to take it with me to get it signed so i'll have to remember to take that next time so i do have those three books those are the only works i have of chris's i'd like to get his new one i know he's got some new books coming out uh, one that just dropped i'll tell you more about that in a little bit when i get to his bio um and he's got a brand new one that looks badass on the way uh but we'll get to that in just a little bit so let me tell you a little bit about me i'm still working on uh kin of the fallen that is about 40,000 words in, something like that, and it's fucking brutal, man. I just wrote some pretty sick-ass death scenes and stuff. It's it's going to be a pretty badass slasher. Uh, it is definitely the most gruesome, gory book I've written so far. Um, and I announced just the other day on Facebook, I've been talking about a special project that I'm working on with another author, but I didn't want to say what it was. I wasn't ready to spill the beans yet, but I did announce the other day on Facebook and he mentioned it in his newsletter. I will be mentioning it in mine as soon as I get my newsletter out. I'm just so damn slow with writing the newsletters. That I'm working on a book with Lucas Mangum. That is the special project. So we are actually working on Diablo Snuff versus Gods of the Dark Web. It is going to be fucking wild, man. I mean, if you haven't read Lucas Mangum's work, you need to be reading Lucas Mangum's work. I mean, his shit is, is phenomenal, first of all. And I love Gods of the Dark Web. I just love that creepy dark web shit. Just That shit just gives me the skeevies, man. Just creeps me out. 
And um, so it's, in fact, I have a copy. I should, should have grabbed that before I even started. But I have a copy of, it's a small book, Gods of the Dark Web. His first book, Gods of the Dark Web, in that series. And then he just released, ah, uh, shit, I'm going to, I should have had this prepared. Sorry, Lucas. I think it's Digital, Digital Darkness. Darkness, yeah, Digital Darkness, I think, is the name of the new book you just dropped. Damn it. He's going to be so mad at me if I get that wrong. Let me look this up. See, we have time for this kind of shit. Don't hate me here. Yes, that's a Digital Darkness. I got it right. So basically, he took the three stories, which um, it was Rusted Blood, Restless Void... I can't remember the name of the third book, but he combined them all and made one novel out of it. So it's Gods of the Dark Web, and then Digital Darkness is his world that he has right now. And it's kind of a modern, it's almost like a modern version of, Di of Diablo snuff. It's like a sick, sinister, psychotic, it's fucking wild, man. Um, and then, of course, if you, if you haven't read my Diablo snuff world, I have five books in my series, starting with The Foreign Evil... Then it's the Grindhouse. And then there's two side stories that really need to be read before you read the final book in the series. So they kind of do, they do count in the series. So Passion and Pain, or, yeah, Passion and Pain and um, Slaughterbox. So those four books need to be read before you can read the fifth and final book, which is The Maddening. So um, let me see if I have any of those out. Oh, I've still got everything boxed up from the last signing. But um, those five books make up my Diablo Snuff series. So we're basically writing a book together, and it's going to be Diablo Snuff versus Gods of the Dark Web. So we're playing in each other's sandbox, fucking around with each other's worlds. I can tell you that we've, we're already writing it, and we've done some badass brainstorming, and it's just going to be some sick shit. You don't want to miss it. And so if you haven't already read either one of our worlds, you, now is the chance because, you know, we're working on it. It's going to take a little bit of time to get this book out. We don't have a deadline or anything like that. We don't even have a cover for it. We know that it's going to be, you know, the, the plan is for the title to be Diablo Snuff versus Gods of the Dark Web. Um, just makes sense. And I don't know. We're super excited about it. So that's the, the secret project that I've been holding back for so long. And... Yeah, it's out now. Cat's out of the bag. So, uh, man, I can't wait to put that thing up on pre-order. Get that out to you guys. Uh, it, I'm, we're super psyched about it. We get giddy when we're talking to each other about it. We've done some video chats and stuff, and it's just, it's fucking cool. So, yeah, that's coming out soon. Uh, what else? Uh, what I've been up to? Um, I, made some, I made some jokes about it. <laughs> uh, Jules has got me watching Handmaid's Tale, just all the shit going on in the world today. And it's creepy how, how realistic that that uh, show is, you know, based on the book, obviously. But, you know, I've been jokingly calling her of of Chris and of Carver because that's, uh, you know, how they refer to the handmaids on the show is by the name of the of the man who's of house that they're the handmaid for the commander or whatever. So we were in the store the other day and I posted this on 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 Facebook, but we were in Sam's Club the other day, and she had to use the bathroom really bad, and and she was walking ahead of me, and I was like, wait up, and she, she was like, I can't, I can't, I gotta pee really bad and stuff, and so I was like, <laughs> to embarrass her, I was walking behind her, and I was like, of Chris, wait, of Chris, wait, wait up, of Chris, and then she was like, I can't, and she's like, stop it, stop it, that's so embarrassing, stop, I was like, of Chris, halt, of Chris, wait, and I was like, everybody make way, of Chris is with child, She's with child, everybody. Of Chris is with child. She was so embarrassed, man. But it was hilarious. I thought it was funny. Anyways, we have a good time when we're out. So, um, yeah, she's had me watching that. I'm on, like, season two. I didn't realize how great that show is. It's actually pretty pretty awesome. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, I finally started watching The Boys. I know I'm way behind on that show, man. And uh, it's awesome to see Anthony Starr in something else because uh, I'm a big fan of the show Banshee. If you've never watched Banshee... You need to remedy that. Like, unfuck that right now, man. Go watch Banshee. He that that show is just fucking cool with the characters and stuff on it. That's it was a Cinemax show, so I mean it's got a lot of graphic sex and violence and stuff in it. But the guy that plays Homelander in The Boys, um, that's what I know him from. Is he was in Banshee, he played Sheriff Hood, 
And uh, so it's cool to see him in something else because I hadn't seen him in anything since Banshee. But yeah, he's the guy that plays Homelander, so that's pretty cool to see. Uh, I just finished the show Heels, the first season that was on Stars. The you know the show it's about like wrestling. It's got the guy from that plays Arrow uh, and uh, Stephen Amel or Amel. I don't know how you say his last name. And the the younger guy that was in Vikings, their brothers and stuff is pretty good show. And I'm try oh uh, Time Traveler's Wife on HBO Max. If you haven't watched that, that was awesome. If the movie's a it's a great movie too, but the show was phenomenal, man. The show was probably better than the movie, I think. And I'm bummed though because they only did one season and they already announced that they're not going to do a second season. So which really sucks because it was it was great. I would still recommend watching the show. It's still worth it. I mean, it still ended in a way that, I mean, you know, ends the show. And uh, I'm trying with Stranger Things, man. Don't hate me. I've, I tried once before, and uh, for some reason I just couldn't get into it. I, I used to do a lot of working while I was watching TV, and I think that's why I just couldn't get into Stranger Things. This time around, I'm trying to just watch it without doing anything else, and I only watched the first episode of the first season, and... I'm still going to give it a try. Jules isn't isn't buying into it yet. We're trying to watch it together. But it's more like I'm trying to watch it and trying to get her to watch it with me. So we'll see. I may end up watching that one by myself. I did go see Elvis at the theater. Elvis was fucking awesome. I liked Elvis a lot. I don't care what anybody says. I love uh, Boz Lurman. Is that how you say his? I don't know how you say his last name. I think it's Lurman. I love his, director, his directing style. Um, I love The Great Gatsby, Moulin Rouge. Um, I, his style is just kind of weird and out there, but I knew that going in and I like, I, I, this is the Elvis movie that I wanted. A lot of the TV shows and stuff like that have always focused a lot on his drug abuse and made it almost too depressing. And, and this was kind of depressing too, but, but it still had the music and the like entertainment value to it. I don't know. It just, it, it was a little bit different. It was kind of the, this was the Elvis movie that I've always kind of wanted to see. Somebody mentioned the, the. The one with Kurt Russell, the uh, John Carpenter uh, version, and I haven't seen that. I didn't even realize there was a version with Kurt Russell, so I need to go watch that. But um, but yeah, I've been waiting for an Elvis because I like good Great Balls of uh, Great Balls of Fire. Um, you know Jerry Lee Lewis. I love a lot of those biopics and stuff like that. I just had always been waiting for a good Elvis one. One more time, I'm, I like to mention in every episode, sign up for my newsletter, guys. I know I didn't, haven't sent one out since the last last uh, video that I put out, last First Chapter Freak Show, but I'm working on it. I just, I'm slow on getting them out, but I do put them out, and I will. Um, I plan to get them out more frequently soon. But if you haven't signed up for my newsletter, it is a good way for me to reach you if anything happens with these YouTube videos or with Facebook or anything else. So please sign up for my newsletter at carverpike.substack.com, carverpike.substack.com, and uh, it's just a good way for us to keep in touch, you know, no matter what. And, all right, now, uh, I started something a while back with influencers that are helping spread the word of horror and books and things like that on uh, TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else. One of the influencers that I wanted to mention this time around is Rachel Schomer. Hopefully I'm saying her name right. I don't think I've ever heard her say her name out loud, last name. But I, Rachel Schomer, I think is how you say her last name. She's on TikTok, Instagram, everywhere is Jim underscore and underscore genres. And she's amazing. Like She's reviewed a ton of my books. She's super active in the horror community. She's uh, part of the Mothers of Mayhem podcast, that group that they have on Facebook. I think she's one of the she's the admin for that group. She's super busy with the horror, all the horror stuff, and she's just awesome, man. She's always taken time out to review my books and so many other horror authors and stuff like that. So I just wanted to say a big thank you and show her, you know, her stuff here on the show. So I'm going to show first a picture of her Instagram handle, a picture of her showing uh, Faces of Beth, my book, on her Kindle um, because she did a nice write-up of Faces of Beth. Um, that I'm very thankful for. And then I want to show you, right after that, we'll go right into her TikTok video that she did of my book, Discovering Ivory in a Charcoal Cave, which is a book written in poetic form that um, tells the story of a man taking on a journey to beat depression. It's a book that means a lot to me. It's not horror. 
In fact, it's a very touching book. It's like the, the opposite of horror. It's of all the books that I have in my Carver Pike library, it's the only one that's not horror. Um, it's kind of told in a more like whimsical way. It can be um, kind of a tearjerker at times. It can make you laugh. Um, quite a few people in the reviews have said it's made, made them cry. Um, I wrote it when I was going through a lot of stuff mentally, and um, a lot of people said that it's helped them. And um, anyways, I just let, let's hear what Rachel had to say about it on TikTok. And please like her stuff, follow her, all that kind of stuff on Instagram and TikTok. I know she would appreciate it. So check this out. If you, like me, have ever suffered from anxiety or depression, sometimes you just want to feel alone, right? Sometimes you want to know that somebody understands what you're going through or um, that somebody has been there and gotten through it. And um, that's what this is. Discovering Ivory in a Charcoal Cave by Carver Pike. And I know you're thinking, he writes horror. And he does. Damn well, by the way. Um, but he also wrote this little short story that is lovely um, and exactly what I needed to get me through kind of an anxious period of my life. Um, I have written a quite long review, uh, which is over on Goodreads currently, and I'll be throwing it on Instagram today, um, Jim and Genres. So if you want to head over there and check it out, that would be great. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. I'm also going to add a second person this week because this guy, Stephen Cooper, wrote this tweet over on Twitter with this link to his YouTube video. I watched it and I just thought it was really cool. His YouTube channel is called Splatploitation. Did I say that right? Splat? Yeah, Splatploitation. And he did this video called Roundup of the Splatterpunk and Extreme Horror novels I read in June 2022. In it, he featured my book, A Foreign Evil, along with all the other books you see in the image. You should definitely check it out and give him a follow, especially if you like splatterpunk and extreme horror. He also has a new book out himself called Abby vs. the Splatploitation Brothers Hillbilly Farm by Stephen Cooper. And, of course, we're going to get to Christopher Rufty's pillow face in a minute, but I've also started asking the members of my Facebook group, Carver's Block, for help picking a horror book of the week. Dina Holden Marzoff helped me out with this one. Dina's an active member of my group and jumped right in and volunteered when I told her I needed a book for the week. She had this to say, My pick for Horror Book of the Week is Nothing Untoward, Tales from the Pumpkin Pie Show by Clay McLeod Chapman because they are chewy bites of humorously depraved horror nuggets. I mean, that sounds like a winner to me. So thank you, Dina, and if you want to be involved in helping to choose the book of the week, join my Carver's Block reader group on Facebook and find the featured or pinned thread mentioning it. Comment there so I know you want to be involved. The link to my group is down below with the rest of my links. All right, I'm sure you guys heard the cat meowing in the background through that whole thing. This one's Lily now. That Lily, Lily sits outside the door and does that. She She does it all night outside the bedroom, and I'm telling you, I never knew that a cat could be so annoying, like could do that for that many hours. I mean, she will sit there and you would think that eventually she will stop, but she won't. Like she could sit outside your door and meow for 18 hours straight. Like she will for that long until you open the door and let her in. Oh, it's crazy. Anyways. She's gotten to where she'll start doing it outside the office door when she gets lonely. So, But if I, I can't let her in here, or she'll knock everything off the shelves and she gets kind of crazy. So anyways, so yeah, you might hear her in the background from time to time meowing. Hopefully she won't mess up Christopher Rufty's book here in a second. It's about that time we go ahead and turn the attention back to Christopher Rufty. This is his time to shine. This is the show that's all about him. So let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about him. Christopher Rufty lives in North Carolina with his three children and pets. He's written over 20 novels, including The Devoured and the Dead, Desolation, The Vampire of Plainsfield, Plainfield, sorry, The Lurkers, and Pillowface. When he's not spending time with his family or writing, he's obsessing over gardening and growing food. He recently released Bone Chimes 2 and has a new novel, all Will Die, coming out on the 12th from Crossroad Press. If you haven't seen the cover for All Will Die, 
You need to check that out. That's pretty badass. It's got the axe with the image of the woman's face screaming in it. It's pretty cool. I, I definitely want to read that book. Um, for more about Christopher Rufty, please visit his website, www.christopherrufty.com. He can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, all that. And, of course, I'll have all his links down below this video so you know where to find him. All that stuff, his website and all that will be down below. Let me read you the blurb now for Pillow Face, and then we'll get right into the book. Here's the blurb. 12-year-old Joel Olson loves all things devoted to horror. Movies, comics, books, and, of course, his true passion, special effects. Being raised by his older sister Haley after the sudden death of their parents, Joel is in a world truly of his own. But at the launch of summer vacation, Joel finds lying bloody and near death in his backyard, a masked man that is the epitome of what he adores, a flesh and blood slasher maniac. When he invites the masked man into his home to recover from his wounds, an unexpected friendship is born. But Joel quickly realizes he's actually become involved in a true-to-life horror tale that he'll, that he'll be lucky to survive. This maniac known as Pillowface is not only an uncontrollable killing machine, but he also has others searching for him, and they will go to great and bloody lengths to find him. Here's some praise for Pillowface. Pillowface is the best book I have read in a long time. Hunter Shea, author of Forest of Shadows and Evil Eternal. A powerhouse debut novel, Rufty's prose will suck you in and hold you prisoner. From Ronald Malfi, author of Floating Staircase and Angel Board. A creepy, gripping tale of horror, and it's got one of the best death scenes I've read in a long time. From Jeff Strand, author of Pressure on Angel Board. Oh, okay, Ronald Malfi was, was on Angel Board. Not, Angel Board wasn't one of his books. Sorry, I read it like that was one of his books. Um, an occult thriller with a new twist. Rufty juggles captivating characters, breakneck suspense, and insidious horror in a macabre story that will leave you feeling possessed by the end of it. Next time you think about taking that old Ouija board out, forget it. Edward Lee, author of Lucifer's Lottery and City Infernal on Angel Board. Christopher Rufty delivers the goods yet again. Brian Smith, author of Kayla Undead and the Late Night Horror Show. Rufty knows how to bring the scares and mayhem like a charging bull with chainsaws for horns. No one is safe. David Bernstein, author of Machines of the Dead and Amongst the Dead. Man, there's, that's some brad badass praise, Christopher, man. That's, those are awesome. So, we're going to get into the book now. And like I said, I, I love the book, so I think you guys will too. You're going to run out and want to buy this one, I'm telling you. And then you should pick up Lurkers and... I can't remember the title of the... The one after that, Hell Departed, Pillow Face versus the Lurkers. All right, I'm going to get into it now. I think it's a pretty long first chapter, so we'll see. I think I can read the whole first chapter, but we'll see how long it goes. I'm going to take my glasses off for this. All right, chapter one. Mother Nature enjoyed playing tricks. Dawn Cunningham would vouch her hiking exp expertise on it. But the heavy crunching she'd heard a few moments ago hadn't been caused by Mother Nature's peculiar sense of humor. She'd hiked this trail enough to know that deer never wandered out this far away from the streams. Those arcane footsteps were too heavy to have been a raccoon or bunny, anything small, so that didn't leave many other options. Anything that size that wasn't a deer wouldn't be friendly and could do physical harm to either her or Kevin. And, as an added bonus, they were pro probably infected with rabies. She wondered if Kevin had heard the noises, too. If he had, he wasn't saying anything about it. He'd just been sitting on the rock beside her and drinking an abundance of bottled water. She'd already warned him to take it easy. They still had two miles left to hike to the quarry. Up and downhill. He needed to save her what he could. About done, she asked. Kevin belched. Just give me a minute to let my stomach settle, then I'll be A-OK. -okay. He smiled. His mouth was moist, and above his lip was a mustache of water beads. She'd worried that bringing him along was a bad idea. Kevin was not the outdoorsman he liked to think he was. He could talk the talk, but once she'd gotten him to the isolated wilderness, he'd turned into a girl. 
And this was bad, considering she was the girl and had been acting more like a man than he had. But after hearing those sounds on the other side of the grove, she'd gone into full girl mode. Don couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched. I'm ready to go, Kevin. This spot isn't good. It's better than any we've come across yet. It's got shade, rocks to sit on, and that level spot right over there would be perfect to spread out the blanket and get a little. No. He flinched at the loudness of her reaction. She smiled, taking it down a notch. Not here. Why not? She'd probably regret it, but she decided to tell him about the noises. She explained how it could not have been a deer, and if it was big enough to be heard where she was sitting, then they definitely didn't want to meet it. Taking it all in, he stared dumbly at the spot in the woods she'd mentioned. From his expression, one would think he had never seen trees before. I don't hear anything. Aggravated, she repeated herself. Like I said, it followed us up from the path, then stopped over there. I could hear it pacing behind the trees, settling where it could see us, but we couldn't see it. If that's true, then what's it doing? Measuring us out. He shivered. What does that mean? It's seeing if we're a threat. Are we? Highly doubtful. Fuck, I told you I should have brought my gun. We don't need the gun. Not right now, but we might later. He was right. Why hadn't she let him bring it? She could have kept it in her backpack, far away from his trigger-happy hands. She supposed he sh she sh didn't think they'd actually need it. Only a day-long hike to camp at Murmur Lake, then another lengthy hike back to the car. Just something fun for us to do as a team. They hadn't been able to spend much time together lately, and she'd hoped this would be a good way of doing so. What do you think it is, he asked, putting his water bottle in the side pocket of his backpack. I don't know, but if it's sizing us out, then it's big, probably either a bear or a mountain lion. Bears aren't so aggressive unless they're threatened, but a mountain lion is. Kevin put on his hat and shades. He stood up, stretching, his ligaments popping and cracking. He held his right knee, rocking his leg back and forth until it popped good and loud. Don flinched at the awful sound. His old football injury had really been giving him some trouble in recent months. It had happened in college and continued to nag him sporadically. She wondered how it would hold up for the rest of the hike. So far, so good. But if they had to run, don't think about that. Kevin absentmindedly rubbed his crotch. I'll take a whiz and then we'll head on, Don groaned. Do you have to do that here? Why not? Because, she pointed toward the trees. I won't go over there. Damn it, Kevin. All right, geez, I'll hold it. He grabbed his backpack, slid his arms through the straps, and hiked it up on his back. It tugged his sleeveless t-shirt up, exposing his burly abdomen. He grabbed the bottom of his dampened shirt and tugged it down. Dawn glimpsed his sweaty skin. She felt a tingle inside her shorts, and was beginning to wish she had taken him up on his offer to spread out the blanket. Don't be mad. I'm not. She stood up, lifted her backpack off the ground, and sat it on a rock. Yes, you are. You think I'm being stupid. No, he said, smiling. I think you're being silly, not stupid. That's just a nicer way of saying I'm being stupid. Dawn glanced at him over her shoulder. Her blonde hair drooped down into her eyes, fluttering in the breeze. She figured she looked good, skin sweaty and slick like she'd been oiled in butter. She propped her leg on the rock and let the pack lean against it. She dug through its contents for her chapstick. As she rubbed it across her lips, she added, You're just being nice. She followed the path of Kevin's stare to her arched leg. Her hiking shoes were tied tight. A segment of white sock showed above her ankles. Her halter top stopped below her breast, leaving a wide band bare around the navel. Her skin was dimpled at her ribs. Rising shorts rounded securely over her buttocks. The round curves peeked out from the bottom of her shorts. She could feel Kevin's eyes on her and wondered if he'd noticed she wasn't wearing any panties. Probably. He finally spoke. You're just being sexy. 
I think the sun's getting to you. Maybe, but I still think you're hot. I am hot, she said. I'm ready to take a swim in some mountain water. It's cold at first, but feels so good after that. He laughed, but then stopped. Wait a second, did we bring any swimsuits? Nope. She hitched her pack over her shoulders, threw on her sunglasses, and kissed him. He should be ready to go now, far away from those trees. Just knowing that they'd be away from here put her at ease. She could feel the water slurping her skin, like an arctic tongue, swishing between her legs through the valley of her buttocks. She wondered what Kevin's reaction would be in the water. Would he shrink up? Probably at first, but she'd make sure it didn't last. They moved on. Staying side by side when they could, Don would only take the lead when the trail narrowed. At times, she thought she heard something trailing them through the woods, but when she'd look over her shoulder, expecting to find a wild animal about to attack, she would find nothing. They reached the lake just short of two hours. Within five minutes, they were swimming. Kevin did not shrink up like she had feared. In fact, it took all she had to keep him off of her until they reached the flat rocks on the other side. It was as if the cold water ignited a scorching spark inside him. They made love three times and fell asleep under the sizzling sun. When Don finally woke up, the sky was no longer blue but orange, and spilling a film of red over the clouds. There looked to be a couple red gashes in the violet canvas. The sun had nearly set. She cursed herself for falling asleep. They hadn't even set up the tent yet or gotten wood for the fire. Hell, they hadn't even made a makeshift fire pit to put the wood in, and they still had to swim back across before they could even get started. They'd really messed up by falling asleep. Dawn sat up. Her skin felt dry and tight as she stretched. Kevin, wake up. We gotta get back across. The sun's going down and we need to get things set up. Kevin lay on his side, his back to her, deep in sleep. He didn't acknowledge her, so she shook him. But unlike her skin that was roasting and a little tight, his was cold. He felt sick. She hated to think he was coming down with something. They didn't bring any medicines with them other than pain relievers and some first aid antibiotic ointments. Kevin, are you okay? The shadow of the rocks above them cast a blue shade on his skin. She crouched, shaking him again. Then she realized the rocks weren't making his skin look blue. It actually was. She grabbed his shoulder, rolled him over, and gasped. A scream brushed her throat. An arrow was lodged between Kevin's eyes on the bridge of his nose. Blood had streamed into his eyes and was already drying. He must have been dead around two hours. Dead? The realization punched that scream out of her. She dropped onto her rump. The rock jabbed her. How could she have not heard this? Kevin must have screamed or made some kind of noise at least, but she hadn't heard anything. She wasn't that heavy of a sleeper, was she? No, she usually woke up when the garbage truck parked in front of her house. Surely she would have heard something happening to Kevin right next to her. Unless he'd been killed somewhere else and then placed beside her, or maybe someone had shot the arrow from across the lake. Her body started convulsing, trembling as an uncontrollable breakdown of grief shook her like a seizure. She could feel a part of her being ripped away. Kevin was dead, and she'd done nothing to prevent it. She'd slept like a baby next to him while he was murdered. Dawn sprung to her feet. Her back throbbed from lying on the rocks for so long. She scanned the slopes above her. They appeared to be deserted. Just trees, grass, water, and rocks protruding from the ground like tombstones. She remembered she was naked and threw an arm over her breasts, squishing them against her chest. The other hand shielded the neatly trimmed tuft of hair between her legs. She'd never felt so exposed and vulnerable. She scanned the rocks for her clothes but didn't find them. Then she heard laughter. Goosebumps pimpled her arms. The laughter was high-pitched and indistinct. It sounded as if it had come from where they'd left their packs. With nowhere else to go, she had just one choice, one option for an escape. The water. She'd swim to the other side of the bank. It would be tough. Not only was it a lengthy swim to attempt, but the temperature had dropped. 
The water would be even colder than earlier, and it had been freezing then. After their first dip, she'd had the blazing sun to dry and warm her. All she'd have by the time she reached the other side, if she reached it, was the moon and night sky. A long shot, but a shot regardless, at her survival. Tensing up, preparing for the brutal cold splash of the water, she plunged. 2. This is still chapter one, but it's like part two. Haley Olson poured herself a hot cup of coffee. A dabble spilled onto her thumb. Before it could burn, she plopped her thumb into her mouth and sucked. The rich taste of caffeine, hazelnut creamer, and sugar was wonderful on her tongue. She moaned. Nothing like a great cup of coffee after an early jog and warm shower. She took another sip from the mug as she walked to the counter. She sat the mug down and tore a paper towel from the roll hanging under the cabinet and wiped her hand. Joel, I made you something to eat. She wondered what his mood would be this morning. Last night had been awful. The last five months had been nothing short of vicious with each day like another low blow or sucker punch to their already crumbling moral fiber. It began when their mom and dad were killed in a car accident back in the winter. Their father, trying to keep a dinner reservation on date night, had accidentally run a red light and the 18-wheeler that hit them tore straight through the car like football players ripping through a flag on game day. Haley hoped the police would have discovered the accident was somehow the trucker's fault, like maybe he'd been drinking, texting while driving, or doped up on something, but no, that wasn't the case. The blame was all her father's. He'd been killed instantly, but Mom survived for two days on life support. She never came out of the coma and died peacefully when they pulled the plug. After that, it wasn't long before they learned just how deceitful their own relatives could be. Distant kin, some they'd never even heard of, tried claiming a piece of their parents' fortune as if it were a twisted lottery. These relatives had assumed the money would be divided equally amongst the family, with all of them taking a healthy chunk of the prize. It wasn't. Mom and Dad had done what any parent would have in the same situation, left it all to their children. Ruth Gimsby, someone who'd claimed to be a distant aunt of their dad's, offered to take Joel and raise him with her Mormon family in Utah for a generous lump of the inheritance, just to make things easier for Haley. She would thanked her for the offer, but declined. It was written in the will that until Joel was 18, Haley was to be his rightful guardian, and a judge agreed, granting her sole custody of him. That was what finally put an end to all the squabbling. Haley was grateful their parents had put so much faith in her to raise Joel, but was terrified of the obligations and responsibility. Truthfully, she felt so burdened that it was sometimes hard to breathe. Given the circumstances, she felt she'd done the best she could so far, but understood there was much room for improvement. Only being 23, her job and own life kept distracting her attention away from her 12-year-old brother. He'd need her now more than before, especially with school out for the summer. The first weekend of summer vacation had started with the unexpected death of their dog, Rusky, a thick-haired five-year-old hound dog. He went to sleep at the corner of the house where the trees from the woods shaded a nice pool of comfort from the heat and never woke up. Joel found him around nine last night when he'd failed to come home from his favorite meal of gravy train. For his favorite meal of gravy train, Joel had wanted to tramp to tramp her into the woods and bury him right then, but Haley had refused. It quickly became a shouting match. She finally said they could go out there together to bury him, and that seemed to have angered him even more. He'd want her to be alone to do it. She understood and even respected that, but she wasn't going to allow him to go into the woods by himself at night. He could get lost, hurt, maybe even worse. After hours of arguing, he'd finally agreed to wait until the morning, and then he'd stomped away to his bedroom and drifted off to sleep watching Chainsaw Murder movies. Him wanting to bury Rusky was the only reason she'd attempted to get him up so early this morning. Where's he at? He should have come down by now. The phone rang, only once, but it was enough to ground her where she stood. She knew who it was. Him. The only who, the only one who kept calling. He was just saying hello, unlike last night when he'd offered her the smacking sounds of him masturbating. Of course she'd hung up, but that hadn't discouraged him from calling back in time for her to hear a repulsing whispery moan of ecstasy as he climaxed. 
On my way, Joel cried, jarring her from her thoughts. She could hear his clumsy, tired footsteps treading from the living room. Haley took another sip of coffee and suddenly felt nervous. How did Mom and Dad do this? Joel entered the kitchen, dressed still in what he'd been wearing last night. His hair was a rustled mess, flat in the front. It pushed its way back on his head and stuck up in points. Good morning, she said. Hey. He squinted at the brightness of the kitchen. How are you feeling? She stood by the island, tossing things in her purse as he sat at the table. He groaned his response. That good, huh? I've been better. Fell asleep watching chainsaw videos again? It helps me relax. Hearing him say that made her feel weird. How can movies depicting scantily clad women being devoured with various gardening tools be relaxing? She enjoyed reading something with scares and chills, but not blood and boobs. She'd never understand someone's love for gore, which also made her fear she'd never understand her own brother, either. Are you doing okay? I mean, after a rusky. Stop it, he said, cutting her off. If you want to talk about it, I don't. This was already harder than she'd anticipated. Sure? He nodded. Okay. What's to eat? Raising her shoulders, Haley lowered her head while warily grinning. Well, she grabbed a paper plate from the counter and carried it to the table like a waitress, sitting it in front of him. He frowned at the two rectangle-shaped pastries burnt in the corners. Pop-tarts? Yeah, it's strawberry, your favorite. You've got to be kidding. Uh, no, I'm not. I figured I would bring pizza home for dinner or something else you like. Haven't thought that far ahead yet. I would have done more this morning, but I just ran out of time. Uh-huh. He clucked his tongue, staring hazily at her feeble breakfast attempt. You woke me up at seven in the morning, on the first official day of summer vacation, just to feed me Pop-Tarts. Wow, you're the best big sister in the whole world. He intentionally spoke to her as if he were five, something he'd always do when he didn't get his way. He obviously hated the breakfast. I know it's not fantastic, but it's something, right? Oh, it's something. She sighed. I just wanted to make you make sure you ate something, and this was all I had time to make. You're not adapting to this whole mom thing very well at all, are you? Ignoring his abuse, she sat an empty glass beside the plate, filling it to the brim with orange juice. Is this okay, or do you want me to, or do you want to make me feel like shit because I didn't squeeze the oranges myself? On her way to the fridge, she immediately regretted having said that. Wow, he said. Ouch. Putting the orange juice on the top shelf, she glanced back at him. He looked pitiful, sitting over the burnt tarts, poking them with his finger. I'm trying my best here. This hasn't exactly been easy for me, either. He flicked a tart. It spun off the plate and onto the table. Whatever. You run off any chance you get and leave me here to fend for myself with Pop-Tarts and frozen dinners. He was right. The freezer was overloaded with frozen meals. Haley felt a weight in her stomach. She thought he liked them. Doesn't he get how hard this is for me? How could he? He's only twelve. But he thinks he knows every damn thing about everyone. Now she sounded like Mom. Haley could feel her eyes swelling. Her jaw seemed to be coming to life on its own, trembling and shaking. She was going to cry. But she wouldn't do it in front of Joel. He wouldn't get the benefit of seeing it. She slammed the fridge door so hard the magnets flew off. They spun across the floor. I'm sorry about Rusky, but I'm also sick of you talking to me like I'm a piece of shit. Oh boy. He looked to be tensing in preparation for the oncoming fight. After you bury Rusky, I want you to mow the yard. She felt stupid even saying it, but it was the first thing that came to her. What? Yep. Weed eat and all that other shit that makes a lawn look pretty. I've been doing it since the spring. It's your turn now, buddy boy. The back of her head was going numb with anger. Her mouth moved, wanting to keep the lashing coming. But her mind didn't know what to say next. She allowed her instincts to speak on her behalf. And if it's not done by the time I get home, I'm going to fucking burn your mask collection. Gasping, he said, you wouldn't dare. Try me. He stared into her eyes, looking for the spot inside of where she knew self-doubt lingered. He wouldn't find it this time. Her earthy eyes had turned cold and callous. Looking away, he buried his face into his hands and nodded. He was muffled when he said, 
Fine, Haley, you can leave now. Have a good day at work. Haley snatched her purse from the counter, keeping her head, her head aimed high. She marched out of the kitchen. On her way out, she glanced back and watched Joel as he folded his arms on the table and buried his face into them. She slammed the door to ring her point home. In the garage, Haley sat in the idling car. She geared it into reverse and thumbed the red button on the remote attached to her sun visor. The garage door slowly began to lift. By the time it was high enough for her to pass under it, she was crying too hysterically to leave. Putting the car back into park, she leaned her head against the steering wheel. It felt cool and hard under her wet cheek. She spent the next five minutes crying, screaming, and beating the seats with her fists. All right, and that's the end of chapter one. I'm not going to go on to chapter two. I kind of want to, but that'll be way too long for you guys in this video, and I don't want to have a super long video. But you can see chapter one, or I can tell you that chapter two is going to get very violent with the woman at the lake. And you already know from the blurb that Joel is going to end up meeting the serial killer. So, anyways, man, this book gets right off to a great start right in the beginning with the couple at the lake, boyfriend with the arrow through his head. I mean, it's pretty sick. That book, chapter two, I mean, it keeps going. So it's it, you guys definitely want to read this book. And definitely check out Christopher Rupti's uh, new one that I mentioned before. What was the name of the new one? That's uh, So Bone Chimes 2 just came out. I know that's his second. It's a collection book because he got Bone Chimes and Bone Chimes 2. They're both collection books. Uh, of short stories of his and he has that new novel all will die coming out on the 12th of this month so keep your eyes open for that one for all will die and let me see here so usually at this point well first of all i want to make sure i mention as i said before check below the video all the links down there for all christopher rufty's links make sure you check uh, all his amazon links and look at all of his books and everything that he has to offer pick up some of his books, um, look at his website and all that stuff there and look him up on all the social media sites. I'm sure he'd love to meet you and love to get you following him and stuff like that. And um, yeah, we all love that kind of stuff. All my links and stuff are down there too as usual. So please check out all my work as well. Usually at this point, I would be spinning the wheel to find out who we'd be reading from next, but I'm still at this point where I'm not spinning yet. I'm still trying to erase the old names and add the new ones. So... In our next episode, we are going to be reading from Tales from the Trunk by Lindley Markham. Tales from the Trunk by Lindley Markham, who is a fellow West Virginia horror author. I have her paperback here. I'm going to be reading from that in the next episode, and replacing Lindley Markham's book on the wheel will be Skulls in the Bayou by Justin Joseph. So I'll be replacing Lindley Markham with Justin Joseph's book as we continue to make our way around. And we're almost done. We just need to get over here. Once we get to Angie Martin's book, we're going to we're going to start spinning the wheel again. So, because Angie's was the first new book that made it up here on the wheel. So, once we make it around, so basically once I read Billy and the Clonosaurus by Stephen Kozanowski, once I read uh Stephen Kozanowski's book, then we'll start spinning the wheel again. So, that's the plan. So, um let me see what else. Make sure I got to everything. I like to mention here yes if you want your book to be read on the show please reach out to me at carverpike at gmail.com or on facebook um, just send me a message and i'll tell you how to get on the list and um yeah at the end of the show as the music plays out please check out the reviews that i'm posting i like to go to my amazon author central account and look at my newest reviews and put those up at the end of the show because i really do appreciate everybody that puts up the reviews for me um, people take time to write those reviews and they mean so much to me and I want to share those with you guys. So please check out those reviews. I'll keep putting them up as long as people keep reading them and please keep sharing my work, man. And, and all the authors work. Everybody really appreciates it. Every time you share a book on TikTok and on Instagram and, you know, Facebook, everywhere that you guys are doing it, Twitter, all those places, it really helps us out a lot. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.